Morning. This is a two-part series that Evangelist Duke is going to be teaching nice. with us. Uh, let me just give you just a brief introduction to him. Perhaps we'll give a little bit more uh, here a little bit later. Well, that's kind of some late leavers right there. You know, get out of here. All right, you can't stay in here. Uh, Evangelist Duke uh, is, is called to the gospel preaching ministry, and of course he's been used in our church a number of times with our teen revivals in particular, but also preaching in our church. So he's no stranger here. He was actually here just, what was it, two months ago? A month and a half, something, something like, like that. that. Not very long ago. Yeah, he was just just with us. And uh, anyway, he, we we have some special outreach that we really need to get accomplished in Miami Beach. And so this past week, he has been going down every day at noon and uh, working all day, just doing outreach door hangers and uh, knock on doors. Had the opportunity to share the gospel with quite a few people uh, there this week. One of the things that I'd asked him uh, about when. He desired to come and just kind of do a special church helps evangelism type ministry because he is an evangelist. I asked him to uh, t teach a teen, or I mean, a, t a teen, teen and adult Sunday school on outreach. And so he'll be gone next week. He won't be here next week. He's going home for Thanksgiving. But then he'll be back the Monday after Thanksgiving. The Monday after Thanksgiving. So there will be an interlude of two weeks that he'll be gone. And so this is a two-part series with a little break of two weeks in between. This is part one today, and part two will be in two weeks. And he's just really been seeking the Lord's leading about this type of a ministry in local churches. And so we're really looking forward to having the opportunity to hear him. And uh, so Brother Duke, why don't you come? And uh, we want you to have great freedom while you're here. Thank you. Thankful to have you. And you can introduce your wife and kids probably in the service so everybody okay. can, can meet them as well. Sounds great. All right. And Anthony, why don't you pass out the donuts? Got donuts, donuts for everybody here. Oh so, my goodness! Uh, and you expect me to teach while people are eating donuts? Yes. Ooh, yes that's, you. <laughs> that's right. All right. Go ahead and take your Bibles before you get your donuts and your fingers get sticky. Uh, to First Thessalonians chapter two. And am I on? Can everybody hear me? No. My, I've got this on. Is it on? It's green. It's green. All right. So I think that's right. So I'm not sure what oh, other lever green. I need to push. So I'll just keep talking until. No. Does that sound I good? I have no idea why. Working on anything. Whoa! Whoa! There you go. Just just need a little love. All right. Well, there you go. We just need a little bit of love. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Yes. All right. First Thessalonians chapter 2. So I do just want to say thank you for allowing us to be here with you today. And uh, we have been having a wonderful time uh, down in Miami Beach and uh, going out and just uh, spending some time every day. I think starting on Tuesday this week, we probably spent at least three hours uh, every day uh, down knocking on doors and talking to people. And uh, we've just been able to meet, um, well, just a lot of very interesting folks. And uh, so it's certainly, um, you know, it's it's interesting. I was uh, talking with somebody, and, in, in, um, you know, I can go visiting in South Carolina. And in the majority of the houses that I knock on the door, you know, they go to church somewhere. Uh, they care about God. And uh, they're doing at least the best they know how. Uh, the majority are. You know, there are obviously some that, that are not. But uh, here, um, I found it to be the complete opposite. Most people are completely disinterested in anything having to do with God, and they're not doing the best that they can to find God, and they're just completely disinterested. And I don't know about you guys, but it discourages me in South Carolina when I go on visitation because it seems like everybody's saved. And sometimes it's like, why do, why do I go on visitation, right? But I'm telling you, you can go on visitation here every day for the rest of your life, and I don't think you'll ever run out of lost people to witness to. And uh, so that's very encouraging. Um, Jeff, Wait, do they know the Waits? Yeah. Some, you know, they're helping down. They're helping down in Miami, and and with them as well. They're just so encouraged because um, if there's any place that needs a church, it's there in Miami Beach, and it's here in Fort Lauderdale, yeah. um, because this is where uh, you have a whole bunch of people congregated together and a whole bunch of people who need to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for those of us who know the gospel, it's our responsibility to just be faithful in sharing it, right? Yes. And I hope you realize that it's not your job to convert anybody. Uh, you can't convert anybody. Uh, the only, only person that can do that is the Holy Spirit. And so we just need to be faithful to uh, proclaim the truth. just had a, a, a nice opportunity to meet several people. There, were, um, there was one guy, an uh, individual, I was trying to just pull up his name here, um, his name was Barry, and uh, went knocked on his door, and he came to the door. Uh, come to find out, he was a Jewish man, 
and uh, was very faithful in, in going to synagogue and so on and so forth. And so we just began to talk to him and, and be friendly and just let him know about our church and that, uh, that we, were, we were there and, and uh, if there was anything we could ever do to help him. And, and he just opened up and just began to talk. And so 25 minutes later, I had gone through the gospel with him probably four or five times. Uh, I had taken a uh, printout of Isaiah 53 with me. Um, after the first day of going on visitation down to Miami Beach, I ran into probably, I don't know, 10 or 15 Jews. And uh, I wasn't really sure what I should have done different than what I did. So I called a, a friend of mine that uh, uh, tries to go down to the city of Charlotte and, and uh, witness specifically to Jewish people. I called him and said, hey, what do I need to do when I run into a, a Jewish person? You know, And he said, well, take a copy of Isaiah 53 with you. And, you know, It's from the Old Testament, and they'll receive that. And if nothing else, just try to leave it with them. And so that's what I had been doing. And, uh, but this guy was just, the conversation was just going so well, I, I was able to go through Isaiah 53 with him and explain to him how, you know, this was a, a prophecy and how Jesus was a fulfillment of that prophecy. And uh, he had never heard those things before. And I uh, left him several other notes down at the bottom about other prophecies from the Old Testament that Jesus was a fulfillment of. And you know, that's our job, right? Yeah. Our job is just to be faithful and just telling people about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And opportunities abound here uh, to do that. And so I know that many of you are faithful in knocking doors and, and uh, sharing the gospel and just want to encourage you to keep doing the same. I ran into a guy by the name of Mark yesterday. And uh, Mark um, knocked on his door. He was just a really big guy and um, made, made me feel really small, you know. And um, he came to the door. So after getting over my initial intimidation, right, uh, just began to talk to him and let him know about the church that was there. And he said, no, wait a minute. He said, you're a... You're, this, this is a, a Baptist church. And I said, yeah. He said, man, I've been here for seven years. And I've been looking for a good church, and I can't find one. And I was so discouraged, I was about to move away. And he said, I'll be there Sunday. And so I hope that you'll pray for Mark, that he'll show up today at 2.30. Uh, there's been a number of other people just yesterday um, uh, that we met that uh, committed to be here verbally. Now, in South Carolina, when people commit to be there verbally, it means nothing. <laughs> it, it means absolutely nothing. Because they're just being nice to you to get you to go away, right? But I don't know if that's the same here or not. Um, and one, one person I uh, said that, uh, well, I, you know, maybe we'll come. And I said, now, now maybe you'll come. And does that mean there's like no way that you're ever going to come, you know, but you're just being nice to me, so I'll leave? You know, and, and it's, you know, you can talk to people like that, right? Yeah. And uh, it's just fun. And just have a fun time and, and be yourself and, and just engage people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we'll see what happens. So anyway, we're trusting that a lot of people will come to the Pi Fellowship. Uh, we passed out 500 flyers already, and uh, we ordered another 1,000 that we're picking up tomorrow, and we hope to get those out this week. So y'all be in prayer uh, while we're out this week. If, uh, I, I believe it's absolutely true uh, that the prayers of God's people are intimately tied to the success of evangelism. And so when you wake up this week, I ask you please uh, to be in prayer for, for the opportunity that we have to be out in the community every day and knocking doors and pray that God will lead us to the people that he's already working on. Do you believe that God is working on people here in Fort Lauderdale? Yes. Do you believe that God is working on people in Miami Beach? Well, my prayer is that God would put us in contact with those people who he's already working on. And so, you know, we have a number of different neighborhoods that we could go to and so on and so forth. So we just appreciate your prayers for wisdom. Charlie had a really great contact at the very end of yesterday, right as we were ending and uh, knocked on this door. You, do you mind me sharing this? No. Knocked on the door, and this girl come, came to the door. And uh, he began to tell her, I guess, about Miami Beach. I don't know exactly what he does. And um, probably telling her about the Pi Fellowship and all kinds of things. And she expressed to him that over the past couple of weeks, her curiosity about spiritual things had really been raised uh, to a new level. And that she had actually gone last week. Was it last week that she had gone to the J JWs? Yeah. All right? And so she's searching. She's looking. And then here it was, this is an area that uh, we had not been to, or Charlie said I, he had never been to, and uh, we went in there and we found this lady who the Lord is working on and drawing near to herself, and he's able to say, well, hey, look, here's the truth. Why don't you come and we would have preached, shared the gospel with her. And the whole time that he's sharing the gospel with her at her door, her roommate from the back is mocking her for having a conversation with Charlie. Now, this is real. It happened yesterday. And we need your prayers because there's satanic opposition to anything that we're trying to do. Um, and so we certainly would appreciate your prayers. So uh, my burden for this Sunday school, uh, just maybe a little bit different. I don't want to teach you how to do outreach. But I want to broach the subject of, uh, 
of um, more or less what do you do after a person gets saved? What do you do after a person gets saved? That, as an evangelist, I have a privilege to travel and to be in a bunch of different churches. And most everywhere I go, the story is always the same. So I'll talk to people and they'll say, well, we've seen a few people saved here recently, but they're not here. They're not here. You know, and I believe that our mission as Christians, we need to be fishing, don't you? Always be fishing. Um, but we don't need to be practicing catch and release fishing. All right. When I when I grew up um, up in, in North Carolina, we had a campground. It was Orchard Lake Campground. We had two lakes on that campground. And uh, if I had ever had a spare moment, man, I had a fishing pole and my line was in the water, you know. But uh, I always practice catch and release. Number one, I don't like to eat fish. All right. And number two, um, we would rather the campers catch the fish than than for me to catch the fish, you know. So if I ever caught something, I always do it back and try to let one of the one of the campers catch it, and so on and so forth. So I always practice catch and release fishing. You know, you, you catch the fish, you torture it for a little while, right? Hold it up, show it off to your buddies, and then throw it back in and let it go around and to fight again another day, right? Well, when we practice fishing, if I can say it that way, evangelism as Christians, we ought not be practicing catch and release. We ought to be keeping those that we catch. We want those people to then be plugged into the church, right? But almost anywhere, everywhere I go, that does not seem to be the case today, okay? Now, we're in the book of 1 Thessalonians. I want to kind of set the stage here for a minute. We'll just take a few minutes to do this. If you want to go back and read this account, you can go back to Acts chapter 17, and you can read about the first time Paul goes to the city of Thessalonica. So Paul had never been there before. He comes in and says, as his uh, practice was, he, he found a synagogue and he began to preach to the Jewish people. All right? And in Acts 17 and verse number 4, the Bible says, some of them believe. Amen? Yeah. Now the very next verse, verse 5, it says, some of them believed no. not. Now that is always, always, always the case with preaching. There's going to be some people that believe it, and there's going to be some people that believe not. Hey, it's the same with visitation as well. There's going to be some people that believe and there's going to be some people that believe not. And you know what? When it comes to visitation, more people are going to not believe than will believe. But you know what? Some of them will believe. And so we need to look for those people who will believe and that helps us to handle all, right, all of those who choose to believe not. But ultimately, it's their choice. We can't make it for them. I wish we could, don't you? Yeah. Well, that'd just, be, that'd just be great to be able to make the choice for somebody. But you can't, you can't do that, all right? But uh, some of them believe not. And then uh, there was a mob scene that had, 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 was created. Those that believe not, the Bible says, they gather together to themselves men of a lewd and baser sort. Sounds like just a great group of guys, right? And what they did was they created a mob scene there in Thessalonica, and they ran Paul out of town. Now the Bible tells us there in the first few verses of Acts chapter 17 that he was only there for three weeks. All right, so Paul had a very limited sphere of influence with these brand new baby Christian believers. They didn't know how to do the New Testament church. They didn't know anything. All right, So they had three weeks with Paul. They had three weeks of instruction with Paul. And then Paul gets run out of town and they're left with the mob scene. The mob scene stays with them. All right, So Paul gets run out of town. He goes over to Berea. And the mob finds out he's in Berea. So the mob goes over to Berea and runs him out of Berea. So he ends up way down in, in Athens, and then he ends up in Corinth. And by the time he gets there, he is so burdened about uh, the people there in Thessalonica. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 3, you can turn over there, verse number 1, it says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you, and to comfort you concerning your faith that no man should be moved by these afflictions for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. So in other words, he gets kicked out of the city, he leaves, and his heart is so burdened uh, for the people that he reached in Thessalonica that he eventually says, look, I've got to send Timothy back. I need to send Timothy back to check on these guys and see how they're doing. All right? So he sends Timothy back, and then uh, we will see uh, in verse number 6, Timothy brings back a report of how they're doing. It says, now when Timotheus came from you, unto us, and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith, for now we live, if ye stand fast in the Lord. Alright, 
Let me just summarize everything that I just said here. Paul ministered to these people for three weeks. After three weeks of time, uh, he was run out of town. And then he gets to his new place. He sends back to get report of how they're doing. And he finds that they're still there. And he finds that they are doing well. And he is encouraged by the good report that he receives. Alright, so if I can say it this way, Paul kept those that he caught. He was able to keep them. They were still in the church, even though he himself was no longer there. Now, how did Paul effectively minister to these people so that when they were one to the Lord, they joined with the church in this state, even in spite of persecution? Does everybody understand where we're going? All right. And my premise is this. If we will do what Paul did, then we can have the same results that Paul had. Okay? All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Let's first look in verse number 10. How was it that Paul was able to minister to these people in a way that they were able to stick? Um, just so you know a little bit about the book of 1 Thessalonians, the first three chapters are kind of Paul thinking back on his original visit to Thessalonica, so he's remembering here. And then uh, you don't really don't turn into doctrinal statements till chapter 4 and beyond. So we're in that portion of the scripture here in 1 Thessalonians where he's thinking back about uh, his entrance there into Thessalonica. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 10, the Bible says, Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe, as ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Lord, I ask that you would uh, just bless this time together and help us to understand, Lord, how important it is, oh Lord, how we conduct ourselves when we minister uh, to lost people. Father, give us wisdom in the days ahead. And uh, Lord, we just ask uh, again for your blessings now over this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the first thing I see here is found in verse number 10. We need to be who we ought to be. We need to be who we ought to be. You need to be who you ought to be. Look at it in verse 10. It says, You are witnesses in God also. How? Notice that word how. That's a, that'll be a big uh, subject of conversation for us this morning. How holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. So who's the we there? That's Paul and those that traveled with him. Okay, And he's saying, listen, me and my missionary team me and the, and the believers that were with me, we behaved ourselves, and it uses these words, holily, justly, and unblameably. Let me say it this way. Paul's life complemented his message. Paul's life complemented his message. His life was characterized by holiness. He lived a life that was beyond reproach. It wasn't do as I say and not as I do. He didn't have to say that. Paul demonstrated what it meant to be a Christian. Now listen, the message of the Bible is powerful when it is heard. Would you agree with me with that statement? Amen. Right? I mean, that's why we come. We want to hear the Word of God being preached to us, right? And it is powerful. But the Word of God is infinitely more powerful when it is both heard and observed. When it is observed. I want to I watch somebody be on fire for the Lord. Don't you? And when I see somebody who's on fire for the Lord, I'm going to absolutely pay attention to what they say, and I'm going to follow that person. Right? That needs to be us. We need to be so on fire for the Lord that people see us and they know that what we have is genuine, and then they follow us. That's what was happening here. Let me ask you this. Does your life oppose your message in any way whatsoever? Does your life oppose your message? Do you preach holiness and yet practice unholy behavior? You know, in South Carolina, we've got a real bad mosquito problem. I know y'all have mosquito problems here, but uh, they drive around with these mosquito trucks and spray all this stuff to help keep them down, right? Well, they don't do that where I live in South Carolina, so I keep... I keep bug spray right outside my door, right? And every time I go outside, I spray myself with that bug, bug spray, right? And I'm trying to repel the mosquitoes away from me, keep them away, right? 
Hypocrisy in the church is like soul repellent. It just keeps people away. You know, if, if, we, if, if we expect to minister effectively to people, then we ourselves have to be who we ought to be. Our life needs to complement our message. Paul lived like a Christian. His life was characterized by holiness, and his life was beyond reproach. And so should ours, if we expect to be uh, effective in ministering to other people. All right, so that's verse number 10. Let's look at uh, verse number 11 here. Um, the, the, we'll see the word how again. The Bible says, as you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. Do you know how you do things is important? Let's suppose that um, I got my wife flowers. Uh, let's, uh, let's use Pastor, wife, uh, Pastor Price instead. All right? Let's suppose Pastor Price gets uh, his wife flowers and he walks in and he's got her this nice uh, bouquet, right? And uh, he walks over and uh, he walks in the door and uh, she turns around and she's like, oh, he got me flowers. But, but he, he, he slams them down on the counter and he slides them down on the counter and she says, here, I got you flowers today. And he walks off to his room and shuts the door. All right? Did, uh, how effective was his giving of the flowers? The terrible, right? Terrible. In fact, she, she, she's probably angry at him now, right? Even though he did the right thing, he, he, he brought her flowers, okay? But it was completely ineffective because of how, okay? Because of how he brought her the flowers, okay? That's what <laughs> now you know, I, I am so glad. You just never know what, what people are going to get from a Sunday school lesson, but I, I'm so glad that this is, this is being a help, right? So, how, all right? Now, now, let's look at the activities that are taking place in verse number 11, all right? Now, Paul here, he is exhorting, and he is charging, and he is comforting, okay? But let's look at how he does those things, all right? The Bible says, as a father doth his children. As a father doth his children. Now, you're familiar with the verse, but I'm just going to flip back and read it to you in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 4. And I want us to think about for a moment the relationship of fathers to their children. The Bible says, Ye fathers, provoke not your children to what? Wrath. To wrath. But bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Okay? God is making a tie here, and He's saying, Look, just like a father is supposed to raise his children, so a, a person who's led us someone else to Christ is supposed to raise and nurture a new believer, a new convert. Okay, now, what can happen over here between a father and his child if he does it the wrong way? Right? What is it? Provoke him to wrath. All right, so what is a possibility then, at least for us as Christian believers and our new converts, what is it possible for us to do to them? Provoke them to wrath. It's possible for us to push them away and to keep them from coming to a place like this. And that's not what we want to do. Now, let's just think about this for a minute. Um, if a father is going to provoke his children to wrath, um, what does that look like? Anybody have a, a thought or an idea? How would a father provoke his children to wrath? Now, I know we wouldn't want to do this intentionally, but how does this happen? Yes? Well, every kid's different, so every kid's got triggers. Every kid's and, got triggers. You know, the time, how you say it, what you do. Absolutely. How you deal with them. So you're trying to say that, that, that raising a child might be an individual thing? Yeah. So you're saying that then that dealing with a new convert, it might not always be the same? That's they right. might have different needs than, than a previous time you went through this? Absolutely. You know, that takes a lot of discernment, doesn't it? Uh, that takes having a close relationship with the Lord. That takes listening to the Holy Spirit to know what that person needs, right? Uh, there's a lot of discernment that needs to go into ministering to someone who's just trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Absolutely. All right, what else? Yes, sir? Disciplining them in anger. Disciplining them in anger, okay? Now, this is huge, all right? What's that? Been there, been there, done that. Well, we're 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 human, so of course we've all been there. If we have children, that's 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 that is true. All right. Listen, the how we minister to new converts matters. Okay. Listen, if we're angry at them because they're not living right, because they're not making the right decisions, okay, 
And all we ever do is bark at them and, and fuss at them in anger. And why can't you do this right? They're not going to come back. They're not going to want what you have. The how is so very important. Okay? Um, so, somebody else have an idea. How, how could a child be provoked to anger? Pastor, go ahead. Probably the most common is inconsistency or message that you require of them, something you require of them that you don't live in your own life. Okay, so there's two things there. Something that we require of them, okay, that we don't require in our own life, right? That's point number one. We need to be who we ought to be, right? Okay, we need to be the example for them to follow. If we are not the example, it's hard to get anybody to, to, to pattern their life after us, okay? And then the other thing that he mentioned was inconsistency, okay? Look, imagine this, all right? Imagine telling a new convert that they need to be in church on Sunday morning and they show up and you're not there. We need to be consistent. We have to set the model. We have to, we have to do what's necessary to live the Christian life. We have to be right ourselves, right? And be consistent in it so that they can see that consistency in us so that they'll want to do the same. So that they'll know, okay, that's what a Christian likes. That's what a Christian does, therefore I need to do exactly the same. Okay? Good. Hey, anything else about a father and his relationship to, their, to, to his children? I, I, yeah, he should just love, right? Love, okay? We'll talk more about that here in a moment. One of the things I think that, that is another point of um, a problem is, is, that, is, if, is if a father only gives instructions and commands to his child, but then has no relationship with them. Okay? Um, for example, okay, I have two girls back there. They're ages 10 and 12. Okay? One of the best things that I can do with my girls is to just wrestle with them and tickle fight. And my, my youngest especially, she just loves to tickle fight. And so we get down and we wrestle on the floor and we tickle each other. Right? Now, I'm not, I'm not giving her an instruction on, the, on a cleaner room. I'm not uh, you know, teaching her about whatever it is in school that she needs to be doing better that day. I'm not teaching her anything. What am I doing? I am spending time with her in a way that she would like. When we are trying to minister to a new convert, okay, the instruction is necessary. The instruction is great. But that, that shouldn't be all that there is. Maybe you just need to get together and have lunch with them sometime. Find out what kind of food they like and, and spend some time with them. Right? Show an interest in what's going on in their life. Maybe uh, when you're doing that, you find out that there's some physical need that they have. Maybe something's wrong at their house or something like that. Maybe you just seek to meet the need. But see, there's a relationship that needs to be there in order to facilitate the giving of the instruction. And without that relationship, it's awful hard to be able to effectively minister to somebody. Now, we are guilty sometimes as Christians... And I realize I don't I don't know you folks, but I, I'm just trying to I'm just trying to trying to say what I have seen. Ministry can take place on days other than Sunday and Wednesday. There's Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays in a week. You know, pick up the phone, call them, see how they're doing, talk to them, you know, invite them over to your house for dinner. You know, be their friend. Is what I'm trying to say. There has to be a relationship in order to facilitate the giving of the instruction that needs to be given. So we must be careful. Does it take a long time for fathers to raise children? No, well, we typically say 18 years, but I think it goes beyond that. Okay? Um, it takes a long time to raise a child. How long do you think it takes to raise a Christian? Well, just ask your pastor. Right? He's still trying to help all of you guys, right? Isn't that what a pastor does? He's our shepherd, right? It takes a long time. So let's understand that. Listen, if a person comes to Christ as their Savior, let's understand that, listen, we're going to have to exhibit a lot of patience with this person. It's going to be a long, drawn-out ordeal. And we need to be willing to invest our life in those people. Now, a, a, a lot of times people think, I, I think I'm getting ahead of myself in my message here, but I feel like a lot of times as Christians, whenever we see somebody saved, we think, oh, good, Phew, we're done. Let's go see if we can find somebody else to lead to the Lord. That is so wrong. When that person gets led to the Lord and, and they trust Jesus Christ as their Savior, that is the beginning of all 
the work that needs to take place. <clears throat> After that, it is an investment of your life into that person to be able to teach them the doctrines of the Scriptures and the things about Jesus Christ that they need to know. It is a lifetime of work that needs to take place. So, fathers have the ability to provoke their, wrath, uh, their children to wrath, and so do Christian workers have the ability to provoke young converts uh, to wrath. All right, let's look here in verse number 11. We've looked at that uh, last part there, as a father doth his children. The Bible also says, as you know, how we exhorted and comforted and in charge every one, every one of you. The how is important. We must minister to every single one. Now, from what I know about Pastor Price and from what I know about uh, the folks here in this church, I don't think this would happen, but I'm going to say it anyway, all right? Oh, and I'm going to use an illustration to present this point about how important it is to minister to every single one. I was uh, visiting a church, and you know, when, most of the time when I go into a church, especially if it's for the first time, I don't know who anybody is. Okay, I don't know who the visitors are. I don't know who the regular members are. Okay, A lot of times when I walk in the door for the first time, I don't even know who the pastor is. I've got to find the pastor and meet and introduce myself to him so that we can then minister together that day. I don't know what happened to my microphone, but all right. Um, so I don't know, I don't know who, who people are when I go in. So this particular church we had gone in, and they had planned to have a potluck uh, lunch immediately following the morning service. And so, uh, as is typical, I was one of the last people to leave the auditorium and to make my way back uh, to where it was I was talking to folks and whatever about the message and so on and so forth. So, uh, when I walk in the door, I notice there's a couple standing over to my left, and there's a guy standing to my right. The line's kind of out here in the front, and everybody else is over here already sitting down and eating, right? And uh, so the guy on my right had been, like, scowling at me the whole message. You know, just this awful look on his face. That, you know, yeah, you see everything when you're preaching, right? And somebody's looking at you with this really weird face. It kind of, you know, it bugs you, distracts you, you know? So I'm like, I don't know what I'm saying, but this guy doesn't like me. And uh, so there's this guy over here, and there's this couple standing awkwardly alone to themselves over here. And I'm like, well, I'm going to talk to one of them. So I turned to the guy who had been giving me all the mean faces and everything. And I just said, hey, how you doing? I'm, I'm Dustin. And we began to talk. Well, time to find out he'd just been having a really rough week at, at work. And uh, he didn't have anything against me whatsoever. But we had a nice conversation. And, and then we made our way through the line. Well, as I'm going through the line, I'm noticing that that couple is still standing over there, just awkwardly to themselves alone. Well, the church where we were at, they had, they had saved the place out for us. And uh, I think they already even had us drinks there or something. I don't know. They had a, had a table setting and said, okay, we want you to sit here. So we, we went through the line and went over and sat there. Well, I got over and I sat down, and I noticed there's this couple up there just still standing awkwardly to themselves. I'm like, that's weird, right? There's all this food, right? Why are you standing up? Right, Gio? I mean, why, why, why not go get you some, you know? And uh, so I'm like, well, this is just strange. Well, eventually they, they make their way through the line. And when they make their way through the line, they come around and they sit with us. And I began to talk to them, and I found out that they were first-time visitors. Now, I want to tell you, folks, my heart broke. And I got angry at everybody else who was in the church that went to that church. Because nobody invited, nobody invited them to come and sit with them. Hey, Paul, one of the reasons he was effective was he ministered to every single one. Everybody gets the love of Jesus Christ. I don't care who walks through that door. I don't care what color they are. I don't care what they smell like. I don't care what they're wearing. I don't care anything about whoever walks inside that door. Whoever it is, we need to love them to Jesus Christ. Amen. Does that make sense? Every single one. The Bible makes it very clear in James chapter 2 that we are not to claim to have the faith of Jesus Christ and be a respecter of persons at the same time. Okay? So we need to be ministering to every single one. I want to just uh, share with you a few words that is used here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 about, again, the how that, G that, that Paul ministered here. Look in uh, chapter 2 and verse number 7. If I pause, I want you to say the word. Okay? All right, so uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 7. But we were gentle. gentle. How do we need to minister to new converts? We need to be gentle. Okay? I want you to just notice all these terms of endearment here, okay? But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse, nurse cherisheth. You see those words? 
her children, right? You picture, you now maybe we've been to a hospital and we've had a mean nurse, okay? Now that, that's not the picture here, okay? Think of a nurse, a kind nurse, right? Cherishing, okay, her children. That's the way that we need to be. That's the way we need to operate. That's the how, okay? Verse number eight. So being, what? Affectionately desirous. Oh, those are, those are big words there, passionate words. Affectionately desirous of you. We were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. Okay? Let me ask you a question. Let's, let's suppose, let's, let's make pretend here for a moment, all right, that someone comes in, a first-time visitor, all right, here in a little while for the morning service at 11 o'clock, first-time visitor, they come in today, and let's make up a name for them. What, what should their name be, Charlie? Sam, all right? Their name's yeah, Sam. Okay? His name is Sam. He comes in, he visits, you get a chance to meet him, you talk to him, so on and so forth, right? Let's suppose he doesn't show back up next week. Okay? I want to ask you just a couple of questions. Number one, would you notice that he wasn't here? Okay? If you wouldn't notice that he was here, well, you really need to get along with God. Because your heart's not right with we ought to notice that they're not here. And we ought to consider that person dear to us. And we ought to be affectionately desirous of that person. And we ought not willing to be just willing to give them the gospel, but also to impart our own souls to them. You know, Paul, uh, once he got away from the, from the believers there at Thessalonica, it says when he could no longer forbear, he sent Timothy back to check on. If a person doesn't show up after they've been here, does your heart break for them? You want to find out where they live maybe from pastor and go give them a visit and, or give them a phone call, find out what their phone number is, say, hey, man, I missed you at church this morning. You know? That's what's, that's what's needed. That's what's needed. That is what is needed. We've got to consider people dear unto us. Let's see, where do I want to go here? I've only got a couple more minutes. Um, all right, let me say this. All right, um, in verse number 11, the Bible says, that, as you know, how, okay, we exhorted and comforted and charged. All right, now, uh, up to this point, uh, uh, it could kind of sound like I'm saying, listen, just, just really be nice to people and, and never confront them with truth, okay? That is not at all what I'm saying, okay? Right? The Bible says here that he is exhorting, and he is charging, and he is taking a stand on the truth, Paul is. But he's just doing it in the right manner. Right? And that's exactly what we need to be doing as well. We don't need to be excusing anybody's sin. If a person comes in here with a lot of baggage from their life or whatever, maybe they trust Christ as their Savior, they don't want you to excuse their sin. They want you to help them have victory over their sin. Okay? But it's just important how we do uh, those things. Okay? Um, let me, let me say this. Let, let's say that um, I moved to Fort Lauderdale. All right? Uh, got, got tired of South Carolina. Pastor says, okay, that sounds good. You can move down here. I don't know. Once he got to know me, he probably wouldn't like me anyway. But anyway, so let's say we moved down here. All right? Um, and I'm looking for a church. Okay? Well, what, what would I do? All right? Well, I would begin a search on the Internet, and I would find, okay, uh, the churches that I would think that would be a good, and I'd make myself a short list. Then I might begin looking at their doctrinal statements that they have online. Then I might visit a service. And what am I looking for? I'm looking for what I know to be true from the Scriptures. I'm looking for the right doctrine. And I'm looking for the right practice. Okay. Now, when I find those things, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to join that church. And I'm going to plug in and I'm going to be a part of it. And I'm going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ the best way I know how. Okay? But that's me. Let me ask you a very different question. Somebody who doesn't know anything about God comes to a church like this and, and they hear the gospel and they get saved. Why are they going to come to this church? Because the people like them. Yeah. Can I tell you why they're not going to come to this church? They're not going to come to this church because you have the right doctrine. They're not going to come to this church because you have the right dress standards. They're not going to come to this church because you carry the right Bible. 
They are not coming here because you're right. Because they don't even know what right is. They don't know. So they're not going to come here because of the same reasons that I'm going to come here. And we need to know that. A person like that that comes to this church and they get saved and they don't know anything about God, they're going to come back because we are standing for the truth in the right way. And we love them more than they've ever been loved before. It goes back to love. We need to love people. And we need to be willing to invest our lives in the people. You know? I, I am so woo, I am so excited about some of these people that we met in Miami Beach. Yeah. They need to be loved. And here in Fort Lauderdale, the people that you meet, they need to be loved. Does it take a lot of time? Absolutely. Is it always easy? No. But it's what needs to be done. And it's the only way that we're going to be able to keep those that we catch. I hope that this has been a challenge to you this morning. Maybe challenge you to think just a little bit about maybe why a new convert would want to join with your church. It's going to be because we love them. Right? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for the time that we've had to spend together this morning. I thank you for the, your word. I thank you for the instruction that it gives to us. Lord, I thank you for the example of Paul. And Lord, that we can just follow him. Follow what he did. And minister the way he ministered. Lord, so that we can see the same results that he saw. Father, we ask your blessings on this morning's service. And uh, I just thank you, Lord, and for the opportunity you've allowed to uh, give to me and my family to be here uh, this week as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. Sorry for all the microphones.